Good morning. Good morning. We are glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. Why don't you stand up with us and let's pray to the Lord as we start our service. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this day. We come. We want to lift you up. We want to exalt you. You are worthy of all of our praise. May the name of Jesus be praised. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Greet those around you this morning. Good job, man. Yeah. Let's continue standing and praising together. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You've been so, so kind to me. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. I 
I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall. In this time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe In this broken generation when all is dark, you help us see There is only one salvation We believe, we believe, we believe
he's coming back, he's coming back again. We believe. So let our faith be more than anthems, greater than the songs we sing. and temptation we believe we believe we believe in God the Father we believe in Jesus Christ we believe in the Holy Spirit and he's given us new life we believe in the crucifixion we believe that he Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back, He's coming back again. We believe. Questions to ask you towards me in this morning. What is the table? What is the table that we come to every Sunday? As you ponder this question, let me describe a different table for you. Imagine a long, beautifully prepared table where everyone has a seat. You find your name card and sit between two people that you have never met before. As you sit at this table, you notice the decorations and look all around at the different people around you. After some awkward introductions, the bread is broken and passed around. You start to talk to the two people beside you and soon learn all about their struggles in life. One is a single parent, a recovering addict, raising a special needs child. The other is an ex-gang member who spent nearly 20 years in prison. As you talk with both, you begin to share your story about your struggles, hopes, and dreams. Even though you've just met them, no one at this table feels like a stranger because this is God's table. Everyone at this table is a child of God. Scripture is God's beautiful invitation to all humanity to come to his table. Through Jesus, we have a seat at this table, but not because we have earned it. Acts 2.42 says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. We all have a seat at this table because of the sacrifice Jesus did on the cross. The seat is given to us because of our faith in Christ. So I ask you again, what is the table? It is a place where all believers can gather around and fellowship with each other, but most importantly, with Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful that we have a seat at your great table. We are grateful for Jesus and that sacrifice he made on the cross. Be with each of us now as we take this meal. In Jesus' name, amen.
empty handed Crying out from the pit of my despair There you were The shadows Holding out your hand You met me there And now where would I be without you? in the desert calling me out in the dead of night fighting my battles for me you were my rescue story lifted me up from the ashes carried my soul from death to life bringing me from glory to glory you were my rescue story you are you are you are my rescue story You are, you are You were right in the pages Before I had a name Before I needed grace Singing songs of redemption Every time I'd run away And now where would I be without you? Where would I be? Jesus, you were the voice in the desert Calling me out in the dead of night Fighting my battles for me You were my rescue story Lifted me up from the ashes and Carried my soul from death Give up on me, you never give up on me. You are my testimony, you never give up on me, you never give up on me. You are my testimony, oh, you never give up on me. Never give up on me. Oh, you were my testimony. You were the voice in the desert, calling me out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You were my rescue story, lifted me up from the ashes and carried my soul from death to life, bringing me from glory. You are my rescue story You are, you are You are my rescue story You are, you are You are my rescue story You are, you are You are my rescue story You are, you are You are my rescue story we come before you and we thank you for saving us for showing us grace for showing us mercy Lord when we didn't deserve it but you loved us anyway and we come now and we come to give our gifts of tithes and offering to you to worship that name that is above all names it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray Amen
right, sixth grade and below, you can go to Children's Church. The rest of us can turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. If we go to any retail store, uh, you'll notice that it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Even before Halloween was over, uh, the Christmas season began. I was at Lowe's one day checking out in, the, in October, and the clerk said, Merry Christmas. And I'm all for that, you know. I just want to let you know it's the Christmas season. And even crazier than that, I heard about a preacher this year that preached to the characters of Christmas in September. So that was here at Smithville. <laughs> After our series on the real royal family, then we went into a series on the Lord's Prayer. And last week we concluded the Lord's Prayer with, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But traditionally we end the Lord's Prayer with something different. Traditionally we say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, some of your Bibles have that ending in there. Others of your Bibles do not. I'm going to take off a jacket, honey. It's uh, messing up the mic here, okay? Is that all right? Very good. Get to work. That's right. Get to work. Notice I looked over and made sure that was all right before I carried through. You know what I mean? You got to do that. Where were we? Lord's Prayer, right? Lord's Prayer. So... The ending of the Lord's Prayer, some of your Bibles, you're going to read at the end of it that you're going to read the Zion is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, all men. And some of your Bibles are going to not have that part in there, in Matthew Matthew especially. Some of them is just going to end with, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, and that be it. And what's going on there, we don't have a conflict in translations as much, but Jewish tradition was you end a prayer with a doxology and for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. That is a doxology. And in Christian tradition, they would end their prayers, being such an influence from the Jewish faith, with a doxology. And so some of our early manuscripts of the Bible include the doxology at the end of the Lord's Prayer, and some do not. And if you grew up in the Catholic Church, I would say that you did not say the doxology at the end of the Lord's Prayer, did you? It ended with, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And if you grew up in the Protestant church, you said the doxology. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And both ways are perfectly fine. And I find today that the doxology makes for a great transition into what we're going to talk about today, which is effective prayer, and we read about that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 9. And in fact, we're going to use the doxology to outline what we're going to study today. So let's look at verse 7, Matthew 7, 7. Keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. None of you told your kids that, did you? Just keep on asking me. But if they do keep on asking, eventually they wear you out, don't they? All right, you can have it, I get it. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives and everyone seeks finds and everyone who knocks the door will be open. See, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches us this is how you should pray. And in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is saying, and this is why you should pray. And he says, you want to pray because you keep on asking? And guess what? You're going to receive. You keep on seeking, you're going to find. You knock, and the doors are going to be open for us. So I want to ask you this morning, first of all, what are you asking God for? I mean, remember, we, we're talking to our Heavenly Father, and if we recall last month how important it is that we can come to God and call Him Father, because in the Old Testament, people just didn't do that, not until Jesus comes on the scene and gives us that holy access to our Father who art in heaven. So we come to our Father who has unlimited resources, unlimited power, abilities. What do we ask for? This morning, I would suggest that we ask for kingdom gifts. 
kingdom gifts. I'll explain those. Before we do, let's think about Christmas. Because that's what you're thinking about when I say gifts, isn't it? And as Christmas comes near, perhaps you drop some hints about what you might want for Christmas, because as an adult, we can't just say, this is what I, I would like for Christmas. We have to drop hints, like telling your teenage daughter that make sure that your dad does not buy me this, but buys me this. That's a hint, a very specific hint. Some of your kids take the uh, little flyer that comes in the mail, and they lay it out, and they take a marker, and they circle what it is they would like for Christmas. That is their way of asking. You take your child, you put your little child or grandchild on Santa's lap, and you listen closely what they're asking Santa for. At Smithville, we do our very best to make sure every child in the community gets to have Christmas. So we try to identify those who need, have a need for Christmas or going through some hard times or whatever it may be, and the school helps us with this. And we go to these families and we get the clothing sizes of these kids. And then we, is there anything specific that they would like for Christmas? And if it's within reason, and within reason is not video games, by the way. Video games are not within reason. But if it is within reason, you go and you shop for this child. You take that piece of paper and you buy them some clothes. And you try to purchase them something specific they were asking for, like Legos. Right? And then we give those gifts to the parents or guardians, and then they give those gifts to the kids on Christmas. And it's wonderful because these kids get what they have asked for. They're so happy. This Friday night, we will pack food baskets here at Smithville at 6 o'clock. Come out and join us for that. It won't take more than an hour of your time, I promise. And what will happen is we'll pack up these food, ba uh, food uh, baskets, and then the next morning, Saturday morning at 9 we will distribute to those who, who have a need for food this week. We just give them this good gift. And Thanksgiving and Christmas are great opportunities to get in that good gift-giving mood, isn't it? Right now, how many of you started Christmas shopping? Most of you in the second service are like me. We have not started Christmas shopping. We've not even thought about it yet. It's not December. We've not rolled out the Christmas tree Others of you, you started last January. The first service would be probably more your speed if you started in January. We love having you in the second. Your, your, your things are going to rub off on us eventually. It's good. But we have this time where we're really coming down to the wire now. Of what is it that I could buy my child or my wife or my husband or my grandchild, my mom? What is it? Could, could I, what gift could I get them? And we really put a lot of thought to that. And Jesus says, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 9, You parents, if your child asks for a loaf of bread, do you give him a stone instead? Now, really close by where Jesus was sharing this sermon is the Sea of Galilee. And around the Sea of Galilee, there's these little smooth rocks that resemble the flat, flat uh, bread of their day. And Jesus is saying, surely if one of your kids asks for some bread, you're not going to throw them a stone and say, chew on that for a little while. And then he says, or if they ask for a fish, you're not going to give them a, a snake. In the Sea of Galilee, there were eels, and there still are, and that often get caught up in the fishermen's nets, and as they're pulling the fish out of the nets, every now and then there's an eel. And in this day, they referred to an eel and a snake as the same thing, same creature in their eyes and pretty much in my eyes as well. Have any of you caught an eel before? What do you think about that, Lee? Wasn't fun, was it? They're just pretty much a, a snake with these teeth that then they just want to bite you. And I get I guess they're really a fish or something, but they 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 got a mouth on them and they'll use it. I remember catching one in the White River when I was about twelve years old. I was very fortunate, and this thing was huge. It was, it was so big in my eyes, maybe not really, but in my eyes it was huge. It could have eaten someone probably in my eyes. I was really terrified of this thing. I was like, first I was excited, like, oh man, look at the size of this fish, and it ends up being an eel. Luckily there was an experienced fisherman close by that was able to get that creature off my hook, and I didn't have to touch him. But surely, Jesus is saying, no father, if his son asks for a fish, 
would throw him an eel or a snake that would bite him. So if you sinful people who know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? What is he saying? Ask for kingdom gifts. Knowing that God gives good gifts. And if you don't know what your kingdom gift is, why don't we ask God about that gift right now? So let's pray. Father, you know us better than we know ourselves. You know our uniqueness and the way that you've created us and gifted us. The abilities you gave us to bring glory to you. Father, reveal our kingdom gifts to us. Give us kingdom gifts so we can contribute to your kingdom. For it's all for your kingdom and for your power and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. What do you do well? And the church, we're not always honest with one another with this, are we? Let's just say that Lee and I came up here, not to bring Lee back in, but since he said he caught an eel, but let's just say Lee and I came up and we sang a special for you. (laughs) We could demonstrate, but we don't need to. Now, some of you at the end of that song would say, oh, that was such a blessing. And you would say that because you're lying. You wouldn't have the heart to look at us and say, you guys, you know, need to stick to what you're doing. The meditations and the preaching are great, but, you know, uh, maybe not the the, the singing of of songs. And Lee would agree with me on that, wouldn't you, Lee? Not picking on Lee, we're just, we know each other. You know, if you you burn everything you bake, then probably cooking is not your, your specialty. I mean, if you can't drive a nail, you're probably not a carpenter. But there are certain things that you do well. What do you do well? And if you do it well, and it can encourage the church, it is a kingdom gift. I once had someone tell me that their negativity was their gift. They said, I can see everything that's going wrong, and I can complain about it, and things will change if I do. I wanted to tell them that negativity is not a kingdom gift. It's a curse from Satan. If it's a good gift from God, it encourages the church. It encourages people. It serves others. It loves others. It's generous with others. And our gifts are different. It's okay that our gifts are different. Our gifts are meant to complement one another, just as the fingers complement the hand. And the hand complements the arm, and the arm complements the body. And the brain tells the hand what to do. It's amazing, isn't it? And our gifts work the same way within the body of Christ. Now, my dad had a a gift of generosity that oftentimes was taken advantage of. And what made it worse is we grew up in a church parsonage, and the house we grew up in sat right on the church ground, so people would often knock on the door, and they would take advantage of my dad's generosity, and they would give their story, and dad would give them whatever money he had And sometimes I even began to get a little resentful because I felt like dad was being generous beyond his means and people were just taking advantage of him. But then I thought later on as an adult, well, dad's going to move out of the church parsonage sometime, so surely uh, that'll stop because people won't know where he lives to come and knock on the door. Because word had got around, if you want a softy, it's Johnny over there by dive. You just go and tell him what you want, he'll give it to you. But whenever we moved out of the church parsonage, sure enough, they found where dad lived down the road. And one day, I talked to another minister in the community here about that. And he asked me about dad. I said, you know, it kind of drives me nuts that dad's so generous because I really feel that he gets taken advantage of. And here's what he told me. And he's right. Stephen... That's your dad's gift. That's his gift. He doesn't do it just, he's doing it for God. And he don't care if he gets taken by somebody. 
It's his gift. And he's right. It's dad's gift, and it's a kingdom gift. And I don't completely understand dad's gift at the time. I do more now, just as we don't always understand each other's gift, especially when we're looking at the eyes of judgment on someone else's gift. Now, hang on to this, because this is really important. I looked at my dad's gift with eyes of judgment. I was judging his means and their motivation. And that's shame on me. We have different gifts. And they're all to be used for the body, to encourage the body. And now I see the goodness of dad's gift and the the heavenly gift that it is. And even though dad's moved on to heaven and enjoys the generosity of God, I have found favor in my Father's kingdom gift on this earth. Many people treat me well. Many people. Why? Because I'm Johnny's son and Johnny was generous with them. And so even though Dad has moved to heaven, here I am enjoying the kingdom gift that Dad shared on this earth. What we find is our kingdom gifts will outlive us. And it's beautiful. Your children will receive favor because of your kingdom gifts on this earth. You will build up for yourself treasures in heaven with your kingdom gifts because you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for God. So ask for kingdom gifts and seek God's power in your gift. We do that by praying, God, you use this gift that you gave me for your glory, Lord. You do what you want to do through me, and it's all for your praise and glory. And we find that His power comes through that. If we're just humble and say, God, you speak through this, power comes through. And I found in preaching that it doesn't matter if the sermon is targeted and timely. If it's absent from the power of God, it's useless. But if it's accompanied by the power of God, it'll do immeasurably more than I could ever ask or Imagine, sometimes I preach on something over here, and you come up and you tell me how it affected you in this way over here, which was nothing of what I had in mind. What happened? God's power intervened with the Word of God and spoke to your heart as you had the need. That's God's power working through a a gift. So we seek the power of God as we use these kingdom gifts, whatever they may be, and it'll do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. I believe one of the great weaknesses of the church today, of just churches in general, not Smithville in particular, but churches in particular, is many churches do not seek the power of God. We rely on our knowledge, we rely on a program, but we do not seek the power of God. And programs can be good, they can be complementary, But they're not transforming if they're absent from the power of God. I'll give you an example. Nearly five years ago, Revive Indiana came through our area, and it was a wonderful revival. It was a wonderful, powerful move of God. And at Smithville, we prayed about it, and we said, you know, I believe this is a powerful move of God, and we don't want to miss it. So we just canceled our programs for that week. Remember that? We're not going to do our programs this week. We're going to be a part of this revival. And we want to be a part of the other churches come together. And so we went all out with it. And Smithville supported it huge. And we saw fruit from the power of God at work in this revival. That year we saw 32 baptisms. We had 13 baptisms that week. I believe you all were baptized on Mother's Day that week. And we saw the power of God at work. So you baptize your aunt that Mother's Day. There was a line going up through here. What was it? The power of God at work. Another friend of mine was in the area doing a funeral. He was a part of the revival. He called me on that Friday and said, hey, is the baptistry full at Smithville? I said, it is, but it's not warmed up. He said, that's all right. He goes, I was just preaching my grandfather's funeral. Seven people gave their life to Christ and want to be baptized right now. (laughs) Baptisms at a funeral? That's the power of God at work through the Word of God. That's how God's power Works, but sadly, many in our community missed out on the power of God because it didn't fit within their program. It wasn't on the calendar. Brothers and sisters, programs are good. But God didn't promise us a program. He promised us His power. 
Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Paul wrote to the church, our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power. And the word there for power that's used in the Greek is the same word we get from our word dynamite. Think about that. You told me you blew out your basement like to build it with dynamite, didn't you? That's explosive stuff. I wish I had some of it. I have some beaver dams I need to deal with. <laughs> dynamite. That's explosive. That's power. That gets the job done. And God says, I give you my dynamite power. And many are trading the power of God today for the popularity of people. They use their heavenly gifts as a show for their own significance. But to do so is a waste of the God-given talent entrusted to us. And it will only build a personal kingdom that will be pushed over by whatever's popular tomorrow. And what will that be? Who knows? But I know I don't want to follow cultural trends. Because they just get pushed over and forgotten. Pistol Pete Maravich was a talented guy. I, I believe he was one of the greatest basketball players to ever play the game. Would anybody else agree with me on that? Maybe be bold enough, a few of you. Yeah, Pistol Pete Maravich, uh, before a lot of our time, but I believe he was probably one of the greatest basketball players to ever play the game. He was a showman on the court. He's the one that brought in the flashy passes, incredible shots. He was the one that, that started all of that. At LSU... Maravich averaged 44 points a game. And remember, this is before the three-point shot. And also before the shot clock. They went back and looked at where he took most of his shots, even though they were all counted as twos back then. They said if there would have been a three-point line then and his shots would have counted as threes that were threes, he would have averaged 57 points a game. This dude was incredible talent. Amazing ball handler. He was beyond talented. When he was 19 years old, Bill Bright invited him to come along on the campus crusades and do basketball expeditions to bring in the crowd and bring along the students. And Pete did. And as they were on the, the trip there, the campus crusade, Bill asked Pete, Pete, are you following Jesus? And, and uh, he said, no, I, I don't think so. He said, well, I think you need to. I think you need to give your life to the Lord. And he told him about that. And here's what Pete said. Living for God might mess up my dream of stardom, the big ring, the millions of dollars I'm going to make, and the fame. I don't believe God's going the same way I am. And so Pete just denies the invitation to follow Jesus. Not, not where I'm going. And Pete had a respectable NBA career. It was nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, he's a Hall of Famer. But how many of you that knew Pete Maravich was uh, don't believe the NBA saw all that Pete had to offer. And he, he still averaged well into the 20s every game, but he didn't take care of himself, drank a whole lot. <laughs> he was always, always partying. And uh, also, he never played on a team that played as a team, never really had a, a good coach. But when basketball was over for him, he retired early due to his injuries. His life was over. And he didn't know what to do. Uh, though he was a Hall of Famer, he was a miserable man, and he searched for significance in any way possible, from hypnosis to Hinduism to being a vegan, whatever it was he was willing to try, because he was just miserable, just as he really was kind of miserable, he realized, when he played basketball. He often contemplated suicide all through his career and then after his retirement. And for two years, he just sat in that misery and felt sorry for himself and began to just lose an incredible amount of weight and not in a good way. In 1982, it was a November night, he went to go to sleep. His wife was sleeping well right beside him, but he couldn't sleep a wink. He began to think about his life and all the mistakes made, all the close calls that probably should have took his life, like the time in college when he was drunk and run his car into something else that was solid and at 55 miles an hour and they had to literally get out the windshield to get him out. And the police officer said, you're the luckiest man alive, Pete. I can't believe you're still alive. He said, I can't die yet. I've got millions to make and a ring to chase. He, he thought about how arrogant he was. He thought about the alcoholism that had taken his life to a whole new low as well as took his mother's life as she took her own life by suicide in her battle with alcohol. And about how his brother was struggling with that same disease. 
And he thought about how miserable he was. And he began to get fearful that his life would end soon. And all night he recalled those bad dreams of his life until finally about five in the morning he remembered that campus crusade. And he thought about all the letters that Christians had wrote him through the years that he just threw away as they wrote how they were praying for him. And he asked Jesus. He had nowhere else to turn, so he turned to Jesus. And he asked Jesus. He asked for him to give him God's power. Jesus, I know you're the real deal because I've tried everything else and I've gotten nowhere. If you don't save me, I won't last two more days, is what he prayed. He said a calm feeling came over his body and God spoke to him and washed his tension away and Pete's immense burden was lifted. And he said from that moment on, my life was never to be the same again. And when I took God into my heart, it was the first true happiness I ever felt in my life. It was the first time I ever experienced joy. He said, I've, I've made the millions. I've had all the cars that you've dreamed about driving. I've done it all. I'm going to tell you, I never had joy until I had Jesus. Pete was baptized in Christ. He led his father to Christ. And he lived with purpose from then on, using every opportunity to glorify God. When we ask for kingdom gifts and seek God's power to be displayed in our gifts, every door in front of us in this life that we knock on, we knock to bring glory to God. That's why we step through the doors. We often knock on the doors of opportunity in this life, though, for many different reasons than to bring glory to God. I don't know, to bring self-worth. To discover accomplishment. To find more pleasure. Yet none of it lasts. It only fades. But if we knock on the opportunities of life to bring glory to God, we find a full life that cannot be taken away. You know, once Pete gave his life to Jesus, he launched basketball camps in the South where he just focused on three disciplines. Faith, basketball, and nutrition. And he would share his testimony with those who would come to his camps he would travel all over the country where he would preach the good news of Jesus Christ. One of the people in our first service said that they had heard uh, Pete's preach in Memphis, Tennessee when they were a young person. He went around making an eternal difference for Jesus. Traveled with Barry, Billy Graham and preached at his crusades as well. Even at his induction to the Hall of Fame, what did he do? He shared the good news of Jesus See, when a door was opened in front of Pete Maravich from that time on, he stepped through it only to bring glory to God and not to bring glory to himself. He pointed to Jesus. Here's the deal. We are all by sin nature, I made this word up, selfaholics. Think about it. It's all about being acknowledged, selfaholics. Born with an addiction to the intoxication of thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. And wanting others to think more highly of us than they ought to think. And so we knock on the doors of opportunity in life acting like we know more than we really know. Or we showcase our talents so others will take note. But we do this to bring glory to ourselves and not to God. And if we're doing that, we must repent. I can look at my own life and I can see times that I've done what I've done for me to be praised. And this life is not about me being praised or you being praised. It's about God being praised. Every opportunity in this life that we step into as believers of Jesus Christ is to bring glory to God. Our kingdom gifts are not for our glory, they're for God's glory. For thine is the kingdom, and thine is the power, and thine is the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. See, when we take our last breath on this earth, if we did, in fact, build a kingdom unto ourselves, guess what? The kingdom has fallen. It is no more. But when we build a kingdom unto God, guess what happens? That kingdom goes on forever and ever and ever. Heavenly gifts accompanied by God's power glorify God for all eternity. On January 5th, 1988, Pete Maravich, he flew to Pasadena, California to bring glory to God. He'd been invited to speak on Dr. James Dobson's Focus on the Family radio program, so he went. He went a day early, and while they were there, he enjoyed a lot of fellowship with Dobson and his crew. 
Dodson said, hey, Pete, I hope you don't mind, but we were hoping to play some pickup basketball while you're here. There was a church gymnasium not far away. So they chose up teams, and they went down to the church to play some three-on-three. And so they went out to the gym, and they played the first game, and everybody had a blast seeing Pete's moves and all he could do on the court. They were in between games. Pete was standing on the sideline just dribbling a ball, his normal drills. Dobson walked up to have a conversation with him. He said, when's the last time you played, Pete? He said, well, it's been over a year, but I absolutely love this. I need to play more often. This is a lot of fun. He said, well, how do you feel? He goes, I feel better than I ever felt in my life. Dr. Dobson said he stepped to walk away and he heard something. And Pete Maravich fell to the floor. He bent down by him and took him in his arms to see what was going on, thinking maybe he had a seizure or just passed out from exhaustion. He said, but he had already moved to heaven. He wasn't even there in his body. You know, here's the thing. Pete Maravich, he asked for a heavenly gift of life when he felt like his life was over. And God gave him exactly what he was asking for. The gift of eternal life. He asked for God's power to be at work in his gifts that he had to offer. And God's power was at work. He spoke to millions. He shared the gospel and led people to Christ. They were saying of one occasion he was on a flight and there was a bunch of turbulence and everybody got scared and people were crying and they thought the plane was going to crash. You know what Pete Maravich did? He stood up and told them the good news. Hey, you know what? Things aren't looking so good on this plane, but guess what? If I die, I'm going to heaven. And you can go too. He starts telling them about Jesus. Why? Because he was living for the glory of God. He knocked on heaven's door and he was ushered into glory for all eternity. Pete Maravich lived to be 40 years old. 40 years old. Now that number grabs my attention a little bit. Does it grab yours? I'll be 44 in a few weeks, and I still play pickup basketball. In fact, I play on Tuesday nights. You can come out and play with us if you like. It's a lot of fun. But Pete, 40 years old, pickup basketball, falls to the floor dead. I play pickup basketball, and I'm older than him. Now, that hits me a little bit. And I've thought about this. It hits me because I realize that I'm playing in the second half, if you know what I mean. Anybody else know they're playing in the second half? You know, maybe overtime, you know. And we don't know. We, we don't know when that, that time is. When, like Pete, we will... Take this last breath. I just hope my last words are like his. Man, I feel better than I've ever felt before in my life. Wouldn't that be great last words? But when I take my last breath, just like Pete, I'm going to move. I'm going to move to heaven. Not because I'm good enough. Not because I'm worthy. But because Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I've sinned, I'm fallen short of the glory of God, and I've been justified freely through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus, my Lord, who laid himself on the cross and died for each and every one of us and rose from the grave and gives resurrection power to live a new eternal life to all who believe in him. So whenever this last breath, whenever that may be, when that last breath is taken, I'll be ushered into heaven. And I want you to move there with me. We don't have to go the same day. Pressure's off there. But I really want you to go there with me. Where we can 
Use our kingdom gifts for all eternity. See the power of God like we've never seen before and the glory of God and give God the glory for all things, for all eternity. And it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be wonderful. As long as you know where you're moving. I believe what made Pete such an amazing basketball player as you watch him his film, he knew in his mind, he saw the vision of the next shot he was going to take, of the next pass he was going to make. We need to see the vision of whenever our last breath is taken, what move will we make next? And if that's a question for you today, I pray that you'll ask Jesus for the gift of life. And he'll come and be your Savior. And I know his power will come into you and He will give you a new opportunity in life to glorify Him with your life. So we're going to stand, and as we stand, we're going to sing. And it's a song of invitation where you can come to the front and accept Jesus, the Lord and Savior of your life. You can come as we sing now. Just as I am without one plea, but that Thy blood was shed for me, and that Thou bidst me come to
God has given each of you a gift from His great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. If you have the gift of speaking, then speak as though God Himself were speaking through you. If you have the gift of helping others, well, do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to Him forever and ever. Amen. May God bless you and direct you as you go use your gifts for His glory this day. Take care. Came flying, stone rolled away.